In the name of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, dear brothers and sisters united in Christ. There's a song that has become almost like a world anthem. It's John Lennon's song, Imagine. Remember how it goes? Imagine all the people living life in peace. It was heard again at the 2020 Olympic ceremony in Tokyo. And that's the fifth time that it's been heard on the global stage of the Olympics before the eyes and ears of millions of people in just the last 25 years. Song has a number of suggestions for how the world can live as one. Let's take a look at some of John Lennon's suggestions. He says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Seems to me that a lot of people already live as if there's just today and there's no tomorrow and do whatever you want. So that doesn't really seem like that different of a suggestion. What about verse 2? Imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. Imagine all the people living life in peace. It's kind of ironic to sing this song at the Olympic ceremonies where all the countries of the world line up against each other to compete in these games, but the soothing sound of the Olympic children's choirs lull you into a soft sway as you kind of just forget the words and you begin to try to imagine this idyllic utopia. The soothing melody makes you almost believe that it might be true that those suggestions might have something to offer. Ultimately, it's, it's not a bad goal for the world to live as one. That's a, that's a good goal. That's actually a goal that God is also interested in. And who wouldn't want all of the world's problems like racism and the political corruption and what to do about the pandemic and the mass shootings and the masses shouting? Who wouldn't want all of those things to simply go away? John Lennon has a good goal in mind, one that God is also interested in. We hear in the first part of the book of Ephesians, where Paul tells us, God made known to us the mystery of his will to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. But what about the means that John Lennon suggests for how to get there? He simply says, imagine. Imagine that it might all happen. Get rid of heaven and hell and the countries, and then we'll simply be together. Get rid of God, and then we'll all be one. Sadly, there's a lot of people in the world that have been taking John Lennon up on that suggestion since the 1970s when that song was written. Atheism has been steadily on the rise, and the religious nuns, not like the Catholic nuns, but the nuns, those who have no, polit no religious association with any church body whatsoever, that's the fastest growing segment of the American religious landscape. If you, you'd think that if that were the case and John Lennon was right, then everything would seem to be getting better and not bottoming out like it seems to have been doing lately. The big problem with John Lennon's suggestions for how to live as one is he suggests that we do it totally without God, totally devoid of the one who actually rules the universe. That's the big problem with that suggestion because God has determined to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And it has to be under Christ because he's the very same one that God sent to bring all this unity to the world. 
So Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. What does all that boil down to? There's only one way to one, and that has to be found in Christ. Has to be found in Christ because by his death, he has united us and brought us all together into his one body, body that we know as the invisible Christian church of all true believers in Christ. Connected to him, connected to him, the head, we all become one body, connected to each other, sharing in that body, being united in Christ. So Paul goes on to describe what that's like. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. This metaphor of Christ as the head of his one body is a common one throughout the Bible, and it's also one that's simple enough to understand. The head gives life to the body and directs the function of the rest of the body. It's pretty simple, the way that works. There was another illustration that occurred to me this past week as I continued to have this little package sitting on my desk from our rained out family fest. You ever seen this little invention? It's a pack of water balloons, but this is no traditional pack of water balloons. This is an amazing new invention because this is a pack of water balloons where there's one nozzle that hooks up to the hose and all these different connections that flow right into the balloons that fill up every balloon all at once, the whole mass growing together with the water flowing into each of them all in the course of 60 seconds, and now you've got a whole party of water balloons ready to go. I watched with giddy joy, like a schoolboy, the first time I saw this happen. Isn't it the same with us in Christ? Connected to one head, the same spirit flows into us through our baptism and fills us with one and the same faith as we all are united together and deal with each other and grow in our faith. We all are part of this one body. But now imagine that one or maybe two of those little balloons, somewhere down in the center, imagine one of those balloons was replaced with something kind of the same shape, except it had some extra stuff on it. It was replaced with a nice prickly little cactus. Stick that right in the middle of that bunch of balloons, and pretty soon you got no balloons left as everyone brushes up against that thing and instantly pops until the whole mass is destroyed. That's the kind of of out-of-character lifestyle that Paul encourages us against as he calls us to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. So as you think about that prickly little cactus, what are the needles we need to think about getting rid of? Is it the pride that swells within us that declares our opinion to be supremely better than everybody else's no matter what the topic is? The arrogance that stops up our ears and makes them useless and makes us only want to use our mouth Is it a sharp and reactive tongue that stirs up anger, that gushes folly, that crushes the spirit, as the proverb says? Or maybe it's not so much a problem with our tongue. Maybe it's with our overactive fingers on an overactive Facebook page that only fuels the fire. What are the needles that Paul calls us to think about getting rid of? If none of those have convinced you yet or convicted you, think about your initial gut reaction, your visceral response to trigger words that come up in a conversation like these. 
masks, vaccines, the election, mandates, President Biden, former President Trump, what to do about school in the next year, what to do about all these variants that are coming around. Can you feel your pulse starting to quicken? Can you feel your blood pressure starting to boil as you try to suppress all the things that you want to say about each issue? Having an opinion about any issue isn't necessarily the issue until we let that opinion run rampant over the concerns of our neighbor and let it dominate them. And that surge for power is simply proof that we are guilty of the same original sin that separated us from God and from each other all the way back in the garden. See, Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree. And in effect, they told God, we know better than you because we know that when we eat this tree, we shall be like you, knowing good and evil. And if humanity collectively knows better than God, then of course we all know better than each other as well. That's a fact that each of us better start to learn. That's the kind of pride and arrogance that Christ calls us to die to, or else we will die of it forever. And in dying to these things, Christ calls us to life in the body as he unites us with one another. He tore down the barriers and everything that would divide us and brings us together to be one in Christ. And so he wants us to live as one and to treat each other as if we live as part of one body, the one body that Christ gave up his very life in order to give us. So Paul goes on to encourage us, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, humility is the mindset that allows us to be gentle when someone else does something that we don't like. Patience is a choice that we make to bear with someone when they think differently about something than we do. Paul encourages us to make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. So how do we do this? How do we manage to keep this unity which Christ has given unto us when there's so many things in the world that would divide us? John Lennon, he had some suggestions, some possible solutions, but they were all pretty vague. They basically just said, imagine. Imagine that it would happen. No countries, no religion, no heaven, no hell. And then all the problems of the world will just melt away. There'll be no greed, no pain, no problems. Just imagine. And that kind of utopia has proved to be nothing but imaginary, just a figment of his imagination. But the unity that God has given us in Christ is not a figment of God's imagination. He has carried out a plan to accomplish it, and he gives us power to strive for it in this world until we reach unity in full in heaven. So how do we carry out and keep this unity? Well, one of the things that most often trips us up is that we lack maturity. You remember your younger days out in the backyard fighting with your siblings about who hit who first or out on the schoolyard when you managed to turn a touch football game into a tackle football game and suddenly all the teachers had to intervene. Ever had to do that, teachers? Remember last week when you got into it with the same person about the same thing? All of that just goes to show that we have a lack of maturity and we need someone to help us, to train us, to help us develop and to help us grow so that we can be mature and one. That's exactly what God gives to his church as Christ 
himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, arriving at unity also goes along with us growing in our maturity. We don't want to have just a Sunday school knowledge that's just enough to get us into trouble. We don't want to be out there having spiritual fisticuffs with our neighbors on the playground. So God has given us spiritual leaders to help us grow, to train us up so that we all grow together, just like those water balloons, one in the faith filled up with one spirit. Today we have a chance to celebrate some of those gifts of God that he has given to his church as we have the chance to install three new teachers to teach here at Mount Olive Lutheran School, as well as a staff minister to serve the people here at Mount Olive Lutheran Church. As we install these servants of God, we give thanks to him because we realize what dire straits we would be in without the spiritual leaders that God has given. Paul paints kind of a stark picture. He says, we'd, we'd be like infants out in a little ship in the middle of the high sea. So imagine this, little Josie and little Soren, they're just out in a kayak in the middle of the ocean with the waves and the winds blowing all around and there's nobody to protect them and there's nobody to steer the boat. That's how we would be if God had not given the grace of leaders to his church to help them grow. But God has given that grace to his church, and so we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead of that, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body, of him who is the head, that is Christ. Speaking the truth in love, that is our way to bring others to the one way to one that is only found in Christ. Speaking the truth in love to everyone around us and never the truth without love and never love without the truth as if they could exist without each other. This is the one way that each and every one of us can bring everyone around us to find the one way to one that is only found in Christ. We owe that to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We owe that to the world, and we won't be naive dreamers and think that all at once everybody will just perfectly live as one. But one by one, as we speak the truth in love, we will help them find the one, the only one that can save them. Christ Jesus, in his name and to his glory be the praise. Amen. Please stand. Hey, thank you so much for checking out some of the content from Mount Olive Church. If you liked what you saw today, we would love it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel or over on Spotify, subscribe to get Sermon Podcast Weekly. Also, if you checked out our sermon today, go over to mountoliveappleton.com and sign the friendship register so we know that you were blessed by our work today. God's blessings to you.